Horticulture Society's 61st Chelsea Flower Show, internationally famous. And every one of those quarter million visitors who will pass through the show in the next few days will find something to fascinate them. There are so many different ways of viewing the show. You can see the great spectacle of massed blooms, or you can look for new varieties and note those down. The regular visitor may suddenly find a variety they thought had slipped from cultivation. And of course, there are the answers to all those gardening problems. There are so many experts that if you can't find the answer here, the chances are you won't find it anywhere. And Chelsea always has to be the same, and yet it's ever-changing. For me, some of the stands seem a little smaller, but there are more of them, and there's much more detail, much more to interest you when you go in close. But if you wonder, why has Chelsea Flower Show got that reputation? Well then, just for a minute, Lock out the sound of traffic and the buzz and noise of people and think for a minute that you're on the fell side, in the lakes, alongside one of those trickling becks. But remember, everything here had to be brought in. The stones, the trees, the shrubs, the river made and planted, all in a matter of seven to 14 days. And when you've taken in that broader view, well then, take another minute and just look at the detail. For example, that is Stilby. Tucked in under the stone just four days ago, but the leaves have turned up and they look as if they've been growing there forever. Just the kind of detail pointed out to the Queen when she was accompanied during her visit by the President of the Royal Horticultural Society, Lord Aberconway. Prince Philip with Lady Aberconway. The Prince of Wales making his first visit to the show and getting first-hand advice from Chris Brickell, director of the Royal Horticultural Society's Wisley Gardens. And the Queen Mother, ever the enthusiastic gardener. And a Monday evening preview too for 40 disabled members of the Royal Horticultural Society. There's so much to see. And I asked the President what he thought of this year's show. Well, it is many shows that I've come to. I've been president now for 22 years, but never have I seen a Chelsea which has thrilled me so much with its marvellous recovery from the terrible winter. All the exhibitors have done wonders. It's simply splendid. I was despondent. I thought, my goodness, it would be a terrible show, but it really is better than any other show that I've seen. I'm joined by Bob Legg, Superintendent of Central Royal Parks London. He's represented Britain abroad at international flower shows, and for the past 10 years, he's won a gold medal every year at Chelsea. But Bob, where do you start? Probably here, Peter, on the largest site in the Marquee. Uh, the firm is well known all over the world for its great collection of plants. Certainly the largest collection of plants in any catalogue that I know, and each year, They've had a magnificent woodland garden, which has been usually quite enclosed, but this year they've designed and constructed on one side of their exhibit a garden for the disabled. There are two basic elements in this design, and that's the long, clear, wide lines right down through the section, which enables anyone with a wheelchair to be able to get down there, and the raised beds at either end. And this makes for ease of and certainly maintenance in their view and the ease by which they can use tools in that section. Now this should work because in actual fact the person that planted the plants is a member of the staff of this firm who is herself disabled. Another specialist tree and shrub nursery this time from Woodbridge in Suffolk and they've taken climbing plants as their major theme. 
They had a bit of a go at it last year, but those plants with one more year's growth on are much, much better. And if you have a garden with lots of walls, well then this is the exhibit to come to. Whether it's north, south, east or west facing, there's something for you. But the plant which really catches my eye is just around the corner. The wisteria, a popular, I think, with everybody. But if you're going to get this mass of flower, then you need to restrain the growth somewhat and make sure you've got the right kind. And when we talk about restraining the growth, it's taking these young shoots and whilst they're still soft enough, just pinching them off with your thumbnail. And if I move over here, you can show the way that John Naylor has been pinching first once and then twice to form those little fruity, little flowering spurs. And if you're buying a wisteria, well then remember too, if you're going to get that selected form that flowers early in its life, to look at the base of the plant. There you'll see the graft union to show that it's been grafted and it's not just a very vigorous growing seedling. There's always a strong contingent of international exhibits. Although this year the Dutch are busy with their Floreade in Amsterdam and they're not here. But last year's international winners were the South Africans. And their stand is even bigger and stronger than ever. They have a team of five English arrangers, each one working in a separate area of the stand because they wanted balance and, and good colour mixing right the way through the stand. But they have, of course, to put emphasis on the natural flowers from South Africa, both cultivated and grown in the wild. And look at that great big king protea. We talk about our hot weather. As it happens, the very hot weather in South Africa has reduced the number of those that they've been able to bring in this time. And even lower down, almost like a chess piece, the queen protea. Can you see that flower shaped very much like the crown uh, on the chess piece? And here, the black beard protea. You can't help but touch it, that soft, feathery sort of feel. But if you touch it in the wild, there's a veritable zoo there. All sorts of beetles and creepy crawlies come zooming out. They will do the pollination. We have no problems with those, fortunately, today. And lower down, the marsh rose. In 1967, there were just nine plants. That was all. And six of those were dying. And even now, the plant isn't saved from extinction. But they certainly have far more of them. And the lovely red erica. That was found by a botanist, Palanzi, in a flower seller's basket in Cape Town. And it was three or four years later before they found it growing high up in the mountain. London's Royal Parks exhibit, masterminded by Bob, and we've come to expect great things of him new ideas and uh, artistry and design. But Bob, why all this sort of rustic woodman's heart and style and the sort of country scene? Shouldn't you be more formal? Salvia's the beer? Not everyone. really, I don't think, Peter. I mean, we do formal stuff, of course, and uh, it's our bread and butter in London. We, you know, we bed out thousands and thousands of plants. But this sort of thing, I mean, I've, I've always had a kin to this, and this is the sort of thing that we're beginning to do in Royal Parks now. We're developing areas right in the middle of London because we can do this sort of thing in London now. So if you sort of stretch off the straight and narrow, then in some of the further corners you find the more natural plants. You will indeed. I mean, in Hyde Park, I mean, some of the settings there now, we're being able to use this sort of material there. We've got water there, so it's a natural thing for us to do. But what about that old log, for example? Ah. I mean, he almost looks to be an old friend. It is. Is that from London? I mean... uh, yes, indeed. It's, it's it's the result of Dutch elm. It's an old weeping elm, the top half of that, which one of the lads has pared down, taken all the bark off and stripped it down. And it's made quite a nice feature then. And the style, I mean, is there a story to that as well? Not really, it was just the fact that we thought we'd need a focal point from one corner looking towards the wheel, and that was the best way around it. It's nice and open, it's got a wisteria on it, you can get over. <laughs> quite safe, you can use it, it's functional. Yeah. <laughs> and what about the water? I mean, we, I think for the last six, seven years we've seen water on That's your exhibits. That's right. I, I like water because, particularly in an exhibit or even in a garden, because it gives you another three dimensions. It gives you reflections, sound and movement. But what about those camassias? Yes, we, I've said before, you know, I've always wanted to take camassias to Chelsea. This year we've got them here, both species, Esculanta and Cusiaca, and I'm very pleased that we were able to bring them. They're, they're different to lilies, we've brought lilies in the past, so this time I was very pleased to get my camassias here. Yeah, they're quite good to plant, I mean they come up year and year without much attention once they're established. Yeah, we can, we can use those in the park quite successfully.
another gold medal. But experienced gardeners like the Queen Mother and Bob, they don't worry about who's won gold medals. It's a matter of sharing of experience and appreciating just who's cultivated plants well. But there's much more than three and a half acres in the marquee. In the Royal Hospital grounds, there's 27 acres of stands, some with summer houses and glass houses, all of the garden sundries that you might want, and of course, gardens constructed and designed, over 20 of them this year. And a roof garden, the theme for third year students of the Merristwood Agricultural College. Last year's students, they drew up the design. The actual designer here was Nigel Phillips. And then, of course, the current year's students, they have to carry out the construction. And if you're building a roof garden, then you've got to have in mind the weight of what you're using. Regular visitors, they'll perhaps recognise some of the plants that the Merriswood students use because they've come to Chelsea two or three times. And I'm told that they're raising a new lot of plants so the designers can be even more adventurous next year. But I bet uh, even if they are using new plants that that big green-leaved hosta won't be left out. That's so useful in May. And look at that very thin York stone. That's a way to save weight. The theme of this, this garden is tranquility. It was designed by Guy Farthing and I like it because it's got several ease of maintenance features. The lawn areas have been raised so that mowers can go over the top of the paving stones. It's planted up with fairly easily maintained shrubs all the way around, beautiful shrubs. It's got water running right through it with nicely planted waterside plants, Pseudoacorus iris, and even in the front we've got a lovely touch of the tropics because in the front we have this water hyacinth. Now this particular plant would block rivers like the Nile in the Middle East. But in this country, it wouldn't survive only in the summer months. So there's no possibility of this little river getting chopped full of this water hyacinth. The fruit garden is not forgotten because there's an idea here to make your trees smaller and to make them more fruitful. Usually when we have a, a one-year-old Victoria plum tree, it grows like a streak of light into a great tall stem. And when the nurseryman cuts it back, it tends to produce just two more branches that go up much too vigorously. Well, if we use the old system of bending that strong branch right over instead of cutting it off and tying it down at the base, then the buds up the middle of the stem grow in just the sort of way we want, not too strong, and not too weak. And in the second year, you can bend them again to produce lots of little fruiting spurs. It was an idea that was uh, suddenly hit on by Brian Self at Dee Smalling, and Bonham and Baisley, the nurseryman, heard about it, and so he's producing trees in this shape to keep the trees small and to make them more fruitful. And he's doing more than that because the rootstock that's used here is the new pixie rootstock, which in itself makes plum trees more dwarf. But if you haven't room for plum trees, we can go even smaller with gooseberry. And you might say, well, just looks like a pretty ordinary gooseberry to me, except that when you go to run your hands through it, there's virtually no thorns. It's a new variety from France called Captivator, which should make the gooseberry picking an awful lot easier. And it's grown in a pot here, of course, to bring it to the show. But quite a number of people are growing these bush fruits in tubs and pots, so why not look about? and find yourself a very nice terracotta container. This one comes from Tuscany. And of course you could grow your gooseberry as an ornamental plant and Captivator will be fine because it has bright scarlet berries. <laughs> Do you remember that exhibit last year on the bank, the rock garden built by Paul Temple and his daughter? Well, this year, Paul has persuaded the committee to allow him to bring his garden inside into the marquee. And that seems only right, because it is an indoor garden with a sort of japanese feel, and it's to suit those prestigious banks and building society offices, the shopping malls, and perhaps even around the swimming pool for that man that has everything. But if you're going to have a really 
big garden, space and water. Then you need big trees and they don't come much bigger than this for inside. Dracaena, growing wild in Florida and then lifted and for six months under net to get it established and then into a, into a container across the Atlantic and a month under glass before it goes into those hot, dry, centrally heated atmospheres and it will survive perfectly. But you can imagine, it costs something. 1,100 pounds if you want the Dracaena and 2,500 pounds for the ficus. And already somebody's shown interest in buying a number of them. The Festival of India theme is featured in the design by the Parks Department of the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. They've included a long reflective rectangle of water, reminiscent perhaps of the Taj Mahal and all that. But they haven't deserted their regal pelagoniums, they can always grow those magnificently. This time staged in 24 inch diameter clay pots. And of course the cuttings taken this time last year, you need to root them in May, pot them up singly in July, and then keep pinching out the growing tips to produce great big bushy plants. And then early in the spring, of course, lots of feeding. And as the show approaches, feeding well, pretty well twice a week, if you're gonna keep those leaves green. The London Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Parks Department have chosen to stage traditional Victorian style bedding and not before there was a bit of discussion in the potting shed too because Chris Bruce, the propagator, he likes the old traditional style but his parks officer said, oh, we should be moving on with the times. Let's have some nice, loose, flowing flower beds. But quite honestly, I'm glad that Bruce won. I like to see these traditional things and if you're sharp-eyed as you drive down the Cromwell Road, you might even see this butterfly reproduced. Here's a lovely old favourite, um, the Bel on the Belgian exhibit, these azaleas are marvellous. I remember this plant in Ghent two years ago, I was lucky enough to be over there with the British exhibit, and these are quite common in, in their particular show, and to get these to these massive size, because this plant is about nine or ten years old with this lovely big stem in the middle which goes right down to the bottom, what happens at the end of the show, they'll strip all these flowers off, these beautiful flowers, take them straight off, it'll go back to Belgium, it'll be planted out, fed, watered for five years, they won't let it flower, they'll keep all the flower buds off each year, so they'll get a lovely big massive great plant again in five years time. Now the other two interesting plants on the Belgian exhibit are down the front, is the Neogelia, <coughs> these beautiful plants with these lovely big bracts. Now, a lot of people think that the bracts are the flowers, but they're not. The flower, in fact, is right in the center, a lovely pinky mauve flower, quite insignificant because it's grown really for its lovely big bract shapes. This color in the, in the bracts lasts all year round, not like poinsettias or anything like that. They'll stop like that throughout the year. The other interesting plant is the carochia, which is commonly known as the barbed wire plant. Now from a distance it does look like barbed wire with this grey effect on the back of the stems all the way down. Not prickly at all, uh, as the name might imply, but just because it looks something like the old barbed wire. Coconuts and a pocket history of how they germinate, this time from Barbados. When we buy them in the greengrocers, we tend to forget that they have that loose husk which allows them to float, but the shoot pushes out from the kernel and grows into great big palm trees. And then, of course, they have those great big flower tassels hanging down. All these palms coming from Andromeda Gardens, several times ransacked by hurricane and drowned in water. Nothing more English than the delphinium. Lovely blue shades and even magic moments. A rich reddish carmine. But I think those soft pale blue spikes of fanfare are the kinds that many English gardeners will want in their own gardens. 
Already this Pensfield firm is growing for next year. Cuttings rooted and growing on. Violas, violettas and pansies make up this lovely exhibit. And there's about 200 different species, hybrids. But what makes it so interesting is that all these lovely faces are going to look back at the public when they come through. But also interesting on this group are two lovely species just recently collected back from the wild, from Greece. And this lovely Doffler eye in the front is one of those. Dennis Baker from Martlesham has brought Iceland puppies to every show for 35 years. And the first year he came, he had two competitors and he saw them off. And this year there are two new competitors again, fighting for seed sales. It's just the right time too to be sowing Iceland poppies so visitors to the show can order and have a souvenir of this year's visit. But that competition means better colours for us. Look at the shades, look at the pinks, the reds, the yellows and the orange. Nothing but better Iceland poppies for all of us. tomatoes to make every amateur gardener's mouth water. Just think of those people with a small greenhouse coming by and saying, goodness, if only I can get three plants to grow and crop like that in one of these fertilised peat filled bags. But it's not just tomatoes. This time they've introduced a whole lot of melons, all grown in Levington in Suffolk under glass. And this is a new variety. The catalogue says that it's thick skinned, travels well, but is sweet and soft inside. Well, I suppose only the Americans could call that Prince Charles. And there must have been a twinkle in the eye, I should think, of the arrangers because they've got in the basket below the melon supreme baby prince charles cut in half and then sweet baby but if you've only got uh, quite a small garden then how about this lettuce salad bowl you can keep picking the leaves from this it doesn't heart and so for weeks and weeks just pulling those leaves i think enough to supply the average family and if you want something a bit more exotic well then how about the kohlrabi you need no more than a windowsill and there you can be growing your own vegetables. Hand-woven willow baskets brimful of rigo begonias from Hellingley in Sussex. Brett Nielsen is a glasshouse nurseryman who believes in precision and also likes to see the pot plants displayed artistically. He's got rustic wood and has also called in the help of Sussex trug maker, Mr. Shaw. You can see those trugs, miniature roses, chrysanthemums, but of course the scarlet of that Riga begonia conic. The biggest trug and of course the smallest one, which has that new rose, Air France. And look at this, it's Greater London, as a house leak or Semper Vivum if you prefer because they have one herb for every county in England, Wales, Scotland and the Isle of Wight. This, constructed by the Lunn family from stock, is on the exhibit by growers of the National Farmers Union. We talk about tradition, well everybody expects to see those great pyramids of flour, cauliflowers in rows, garnished with parsley, the best of rhubarb and fruit, that Ida red that keeps so well, and what's this? Oranges and lemons. They come from Kiora nurseries down in Sussex. And Mrs. Pitt brought them for her son. The last time she came to Chelsea was 1939. She said there's been some changes, but still one of the finest shows you can ever come and see. And asparagus from Evesham. The cutting tool and the old wood block they used to make the bunches. And one or two illustrations of how you grow them. The crowns the spikes you cut, and alongside those popular house plants, the asparagus, fair eye, and plumosa. For the second year, Slough Parks Department have got a seed company sponsor. Those local authorities watching the pennies and certainly can do with some financial support to bring exhibits here. Last year, you may remember, Slough had Chysanthus, magnificent plants. But that's not the same. This year, they've chosen calcellarias and all the different kinds, the small flowered bubbles, and those great big fellows, but just look at the quality. Money might be tight, but there's uh, no shortage of skill when it comes to the plant. Quite a modest pot and a little short, compact plant, 
but then look at the quantity and number of flowers on each individual plant. Papiopidillums, there's a terrible name to pronounce. Some of you may have known it in the old times as Cypripedium, but I prefer, I think, the name Venus Slipper. That's what it is translated. But new hybrids, of course, have changed the original species and increased their size, one would say almost out of all recognition. They like quite coolish conditions. They grow anywhere from India across to Burma. But I think that the specialists will be watching for the very latest hybrid. For example, Commando Surprise. Roses. That magnificent Florabunda Iceberg. A perfect variety for every garden, it just flowers and flowers. And roses are used here to surround that great monument which grows up out of the marquee area. But roses are launched at Chelsea. Over 50 of the rose growers in Britain voted Mountbatten, the Rose of the Year. It's uh, the first time that they've actually made that sort of award and they've been looking at seedlings for three years and it was because of the disease resistance, the strong healthy foliage, no trouble with black spot and the free flowering right the way through into the winter that this was chosen and they've budded over 200,000 of them. So you'll have no difficulty getting this I think come autumn. Well Peter I've got sea spray. Now it's a cluster rose and I think this is going to do just as well. This, this was introduced for a charity, the British Epilepsy Association, and I think this is going to go far. I like it because it's got this loose petal effect in the middle, and that's going to make it very, very easy for us in parks, but I'm sure for the amateur as well in the way of maintenance. But how about this then? Because I, there's going to be lots and lots of these mini roses on the supermarket shelves. This is a variety called Pink Sunblaze. An inside-out rose, because you have it indoors for perhaps six weeks or six months, and when it gets a bit tatty, then you plant it in the garden. I've got Chelsea Pensioner, <laughs> uh, a, a nice red, and this is going to be, as you say, it's, your, yours is going to flower almost in flower now. This is going to be a mass of bloom in a couple of weeks, and that, that, that's going to sell well. But I think the sort of rose that uh, lots of visitors want to see are those great HTs, and this is a variety called Can Can. I'm not sure what the late Mr. Legrice would have said about its name, but it really is a lovely rose. Well, if that dance is about, then I've got <laughs> tranquility. And I don't know what you think, but um, I'm sure both of them have got very good fragrance. Oh, this one's absolutely beautiful. Well, this is good as well. Cut chrysanthemums flown in from Colombia. And another reminder about competition, because glasshouse growers in Europe who have to face those very expensive heating bills, look with envy on the growers from Colombia who of course can grow outside in the sun's heat and have uh, only the cost of flying them in. But there shouldn't be any argument about those lovely blue agapanthus. No competition with agapanthus flowers in our flower shops. Mention the name Alan Bloom anywhere in the world and they'll say to you in horticultural circles, oh yes, hardy border flowers, island beds that you can cultivate from each side and you don't need to stake the shorter varieties he's introduced. This year he's got a new geranium named Lawrence Flatman. That's uh, almost in thanks for a fellow who's been working for him since uh, he left school and now as a director has nearly 40 years service. The National Association of Flower Arrangement Societies, this year represented by the Sussex Group. Eleven ladies selected to do the work here, and Mrs. Anne Scott responsible for this arrangement. Why, they really do know their stuff, these ladies, and when they start to arrange in competition, the competition again is terribly tough. One of the flowers I love to see at this time of the year is the tree peony. What a luxurious, extravagant thing it is. You'd hardly believe that it would grow outside completely unprotected from the weather. A rock garden built on a table. The work of Paul and Will Ingerson. And Will was telling me that if you want a pretty blue flower that flowers and flowers right through the summer, then look for this Pratia pendunculata. 
Quite easy to grow too, he said it grows like a weed and you can root the cuttings at this time of year. But I think the children might be interested in this, the mouse tail plant, Aracerum proboscidium. It grows in quite cool, shaded sort of spots. And just look at the shape of that flower. You couldn't help but laugh at that tail, could you? And lovely green leaves too. The flower arrangers might be pinching one or two of those. Each year at Chelsea, house plants are always a feature, and this firm is no exception. Betty Rochford, who designed and exhibits each year, she's made a fine job of this this year. And one of the interesting plants that she's introduced is Kalinkoe pumila, a lovely plant. It flowers in March, but its foliage effect is quite striking, a little bit different from the ordinary thing. So it's, if, it's, if you see it around, try and get it. Hoya multiflora, introduced to Britain in 1839, and now the very latest methods of micropropagation are being used to increase its numbers. You know, that's the way they get the tiny tip of a plant, get it to root in agar in a test tube, and then multiply them up in sterile laboratory conditions. And if all goes well and things are looking pretty good, it should be in the shops later this year. It doesn't want any special prizes either. To guess why they call this flower shooting stars. The Rose Victoriana, a really unusual shade. And you know, it's great fun to stand in amongst the visitors and hear them discuss, and perhaps one might almost say, argue with one another about just what rose to choose. Some like these unusual colors and others will say, oh, I'm not so sure. I think I'd prefer to stay with the good, straight, single rose that we can cut from the garden and arrange indoors. But the flower arrangers then, uh, they look for the unusual. They use their artistic skill to select out a thing like this rose, Grey Dawn, and arrange it with the greys and the blues to really make beautiful arrangements. And there's even a rose that uh, some would call brown, it's certainly in the sepia range, called Julia's Rose. Julia Clements, the famous flower arranger. Oh, look at this, checkerboard. We talk about quality. Well, I don't think I've seen better standard fuchsias. Must be best part of two years old, and look at the spread of branches and the number of flowers on that and the red and white swing time. You know, that's a variety that makes a good standard and it's also a beautiful variety for baskets. Those branches just hanging down full of double flowers. It wouldn't be Chelsea, of course, without rhododendrons. And here we've got the smaller growing type, rhododendron yacushaminum hybrid. A lot of them were bred by Mr. Percy Wiseman, and the variety that carries his name is still one of the finest for our gardens. Not only are they dwarf, compact, and full of flowers, but once the flowers are finished, the leaves are very attractive, and the undersides nicely brown and quite unusual. Give them plenty of peat, keep them damp in the summer, and they'll grow for you. The show has become the launch place for books as well as plants and gardening equipment, and this year there are five books being launched. One by Stephen Bailey. He's been showing carnations and pinks for years. He won the Williams Award last year for the best exhibit of carnations and pinks. And so uh, if you want to know all there is about carnations, there's one book to start you off. And uh, the definitive work too on bonsai, written by Anne Swinton. She's been exhibiting too for many years and the trees illustrated in her book have actually been grown by her and a number of them exhibited on the stands like this and the Royal Horticultural Society has added to its Wisley series with a book on orchids just over a pound and one on gardening by the sea. There's even a book on the Chelsea Flower Show itself written by Jeff and Faith Whiten. They've built gardens outside for a number of years uh, and they're here again this year. Jeff and Faith like their garden designs to be within the reach of ordinary suburban homeowners and there's lots of ideas here for them.
this garden, the brainchild of Russ Weymouth. He's a student of landscape architecture at the Gloucestershire College of Art and Technology. Actually, there was a competition set up amongst his fellow students and the garden sponsored by one of the high street's leading stores. They said just what had to go into the garden and of course they wanted uh, vegetable seeds grown from those packets, the bright bedding plants that are so popular with everybody shopping down the high street and the more modestly priced shrubs that we can plant quite thickly to smother the weeds. Uh, they even had to include the plants and materials for the hanging basket on the trellis by the back door. If you've got a few thousand pounds to spend, then how about a conservatory? Just a nine foot square, and this one costs 3,500. If you've a little more, well then you can get one a little bigger perhaps. But remember, this was the bank where the gardens were constructed, fruit gardens, a lovely wooden summer house, and a rock garden to look out on. And beside it, this year, the largest collection of small and dwarf growing conifers ever staged at the Chelsea Flower Show. And beside that, well, then there's a garden to display sculpture. But if you're sort of leaving one end of your garden a little bit rough, you might look for the garden for the conservationist. One or two people sort of said with a wry smile, that looks a bit too much like the garden back home. But just, but just remember, as we were coming across that garden for sculpture, beautiful pieces of artwork, but it Mr. Proben Jacobson. He's a Dane who really is breaking the barriers in garden design. He's an absolute stickler too, that everything he has designed is carried out to the letter. Perfect artistry here. A bird's eye view for this garden. Just imagine looking out of the bedroom down onto the design here. I try not to have favourites, but each year Peter Rogers' design tends to catch my eye because he has very much the small garden in mind and what we can do with those small gardens. You need to start out, of course, with a well thought out plan and then work slowly from one corner. I mean, the nice blue-green conifer in a square, moving out into a bigger rectangle of water and a nice statue, if you like, that kind of thing, and a grass square and even the bedding. Your summer flower bedding changed with spring bulbs. A really lovely garden. Yes, some marvellous gardens here, Peter. I think, in actual fact, the exhibitors have really excelled themselves. The, but for me, the memory of the show is going to be that marvellous Lakeland garden reproduced by Douglas Knight on the rock bank. Yes, and I think the judges agree with you because they've awarded the, the, the trophy for this year's best outside garden. Well, there's just two days of the show left from 8 o'clock in the morning tomorrow until 8 at night, and then from 8 until 5 on Friday. If you've got a chance to come, however far the distance, it'll be worth your while. Good night.